everyone. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me, guys. It's uh, it's good to be here. And uh, Chris's conversation uh, that you just had with you was is quite um, poignant, and uh, it's a nice segue into what I'll be speaking about. Uh, just to give you a quick introduction to who I am and, and the kind of work that um, me and my team do. I'm the Senior Managing Director at Ankura, in, uh, based out of the Sydney office, but we uh, I lead the region in wider APAC. And we also do some work um, virtually, of course, um, in India too. Uh, we predominantly work in two focus areas in cybersecurity, one being uh, strategic cybersecurity, where we align the overall cybersecurity strategy of our clients with their business strategy and uh, cybersecurity maturity reviews. So we do a lot of work with private equity and investment banking where we do uh, both cyber and technology due diligence on um, private equity acquisitions or current portfolio companies. We do a lot of work in IT governance and policy reviews. Um, and we do quite a bit of work with uh, federal and state government in Australia and also uh, foreign governments as well. Uh, the other side of the business is a deeply technical digital forensics and incident response. Now, uh, over the lockdown period, uh, that side of the business just went crazy. It was unbelievable. Um, the amount of work that we, I couldn't hire people fast enough and it's still a problem that I have. Um, so it's, it's really interesting work that we're doing and very complex and, uh, We've invested a lot of time and money and into getting the best people and the best tools on board. So it's um, an exciting time in the in the industry right now. And you know, and that's what I wanted to talk about with you today. And I, I, ethics is, an, is sometimes can be a dry topic, but I've tried to make it a little bit more enjoyable uh, by including some funny pictures and memes. And I've got some uh, you know some good stories and some interesting statistics. But as we all know, and it, in India particularly, uh, global connectivity is on a meteoric rise. Uh, we're seeing everyday items connected to the internet like refrigerators and maybe monitors and washing machines and vehicles and medical devices and even you know, things like fish tanks. And as that type of innovative technology proliferates and evolves, it becomes increasingly embedded in our personal and our working lives. However, as we all know, as IT and cybersecurity professionals, as connectivity increases, it leads to increased risks for global citizens and businesses. And cybersecurity is a hot topic, and it's only going to be increasingly so leading into 2021. Cybersecurity spending, um, last uh, review by Gartner, they predicted it'd be, uh, in 2020, spending would be 124 billion US dollars. And you only have to look at the recent and really highly publicized cyber attacks against places like uh, MyGov and uh, Data Number Three, uh, Toll Group, and um, Yahoo, and uh, Marriott, and all these other huge data breaches that have been in the public eye. Um, and it illustrates the pervasive threat of cyber criminals. And it gets even more depressing <laughs> the more you delve into the statistics of data breaches, particularly their effect on small to medium businesses, which is a problem that is long, a long way from being solved, in my opinion, in, in every country. But cyber incidents aren't the only concern arising from the proliferation of technology. Uh, ethical issues, particularly concerning automation and artificial intelligence and robotics are now front in mind for both the public and media. Um, and some recent incidents have uh, really brought it to the forefront of people's minds. Um, and the most notable in my mind would be uh, in early 2018. I don't know if you, any of you recall, but when an Uber self-driving car uh, ran over somebody and killed them. And it makes it, the questions were asked, um, ethical questions around who is ultimately responsible. Is it the manufacturer, the driver, the software programmers? And, and I bring up that point is because there's, there's always a trade-off in technology. Uh, the trade-off by achieving a balance between accessibility and security, uh, functionality and compliance, and convenience and privacy. But it's essential to achieve a balance between these themes to establish trust, as Carissa spoke about, and minimize any potential harmful effect of the loss or theft or manipulation or destruction of sensitive data. As we create and adopt technology, there needs to be ethically sound standards and regulations that govern the use of AI and automation and other innovative technology. And what I want to talk to you about today is 
that innovative technology and the ethical issues for both the cyber and the tech communities, uh, the efficacy of current regulations and guidelines, and, uh, and also the options available for organisations who want to embed ethical decision making into their culture. Now, this is something that I go on about a lot um, on LinkedIn or on Twitter or when I present at conferences or I'm in the media. Um, and it's something that's close to my heart is, is being purpose driven and being um, actually living by the values that you purport to have both as an individual and as an organisation. And we don't see enough of it. And ethical decision making is about making the right choice and the reasoning behind those choices. And it's my opinion that the standard of ethics in an organisation is a direct reflection on the purpose of the organisation. It, it forms the basis of the organisational purpose by asking the question, why do we do what we do? And ethics in cybersecurity is about what decisions are aligned with our values and what is morally acceptable for both the data owner and the organisation which stores that data. And ethical standards should also describe how to implement processes for ensuring ethical decision making. But ethical issues, while most people don't connect them with technology and cybersecurity, it's a daily occurrence. Every organisation that stores personal and sensitive data has a responsibility to ensure that ethics are interwoven throughout the company, all the way from the boardroom down to interns and grads. And ethical decision making promotes transparency and honesty and the pursuit of values uh, leads to, as Chris has spoke about, greater trust in the marketplace and in turn, greater profitability. In fact, if you look at the Edelman Trust Barometer, uh, they've shown that companies that are more trusted than their nearest competitor are 10% more profitable. But the public and consumers and the media, they have an expectation now that the data that those organizations store and use that they implement effective frameworks for guiding ethical decisions concerning the CIA triad, the confidentiality, integrity and availability of that data. And they expect organisations to abide by the, their promises and abide by legislation and the regulations that, that govern them. But as we've seen in recent times, legally right does not always equate to morally right. It demonstrated here in Australia where uh, the federal court suffered a data breach and the information that was uh, breached was pertaining to at-risk asylum seekers. And these at-risk asylum seekers, the federal court made a decision that they weren't going to inform those data owners. Now, at-risk asylum seekers, when they uh, apply for a visa uh, in most countries that works this way, uh, it means they're at risk or they fear for their safety in their home country. Now that data breach happened, which means their home country governments uh, could have gained access to that information and found out exactly who those at-risk asylum seekers were. Meaning if we denied that at-risk visa here in Australia, um, those people's lives certainly, almost certainly would have been in danger. Now, for me, that's a, it might be a legally right decision, but in my mind, it's is morally, um, corrupt in my mind it's certainly in a gray area but there's often competing values of legislation versus ethics and the decision to abide by one or another uh, you must take into account your organization's corporate social responsibilities and what's in line with both the organization values and your personal values but if you look at uh, and and i'll go over this briefly this uh, this section um, you know, emerging technology, because Chris had covered it quite succinctly, but the, some of the statistics, I'll just go through them quickly, but average cost of a data breach, $3.86 million. Um, likelihood of a recurring breach is about 28% after that significant breach. If it's more than a million records, it's gonna cost approximately $40 million. If more than 50 million records, it's gonna cost a staggering $350 million. And that's the large end of town, but Globally, what I've seen, particularly in APAC, you see small to medium businesses, they've long held a, a um, an incorrect view or a folly adieu that they fly under the radar of cyber criminals because they're too small to target. But the recent, recent statistics from uh, Verizon show that's no longer the case because 43% of data breaches are small business victims. 
And here in Australia, we've got research to show that over 60% of small to medium businesses go bankrupt within 12 months of suffering a data breach and staggering. So it's no longer a, an option for Australian businesses, regardless of their size or international businesses as well, um, to do nothing and hope for the best. And then there's emerging technology as Internet of Things. Uh, it's designed to solve problems and uh, that affect us as humans and make our lives easier and more enjoyable. Um, but likewise, that, that cutting edge technology can be used against us. Um, the employment of IoT yields a lot of benefits, but it's not without risks to privacy and, and security concerns and liability around automation uh, and a lack of global standards and regulations. Uh, you know, there, there's no requirement currently for most technology firms to embed cybersecurity controls into um, IoT devices at the start of their production or even during the planning phase. It's often thought of, thought of as an add-on. And there's numerous cases where IoT has gone wrong from hacked vehicles, hashed, hacked fish tanks, uh, baby monitors, uh, destruction of nuclear reactors um, in testing and um, shutdown of some of the largest websites in the world with the Mirai botnet. Um, you know, there's, there's countless um, examples of, of things that have gone wrong. But in other ways, artificial intelligence, you know, deep fakes, uh, deep fakes being a fake video or image or audio message that looks realistic um, and malicious use of AI to, it takes phishing to a whole new level of sophistication and it can trick people into handing over their passwords and sensitive data. And I dare say we'll see a lot more of these. Additionally, malicious actors could use deep fakes to manipulate elections. You know, we're seeing a lot of uh, contention over election security out of the US. A lot of those are down to conspiracy theories, but it brings up interesting points about the possibility of um, manipulation of election results. Um, and the types of fake news, you know, uh, using AI and causing electoral disruption or conflict with foreign governments. Um, and, you know, quantum computing as well. Um, some people argue that quantum computing, not AI, will define our future. Um, you know, if, you, if you're not aware of what quantum computing is, it's uh, classical computing systems are binary, which means they work on bits that are either zeros or ones. Uh, quantum computers are not limited to binary bits. They use something called quantum bits or qubits. Uh, qubits consist of atoms and ions and electrons and photons and control mechanisms all working collaboratively as a, both a memory and a processor. Uh, because a quantum computer isn't limited to binary processing, it can contain multiple states at the same time, which gives it the ability to be infinitely more powerful than even the most advanced computing systems. And if you want to look into research more of uh, being multiple states at the same time, look up the uh, Schrodinger's cat exercise, it's quite interesting. But, um, and you know, the use of cyber criminals with quantum computing, uh, they can use it to break advanced encryption algorithms and um, hatching standards uh, that we currently have would be broken quite easily with quantum computing. Um, and likewise, cloud computing as well, uh, Dr. Evil there, <laughs> uh, but cloud computing is something that we're dealing with that's at the forefront of uh, the questions in our clients' mind is uh, almost all of them are, are currently migrating to cloud, have migrated to cloud, or are very seriously thinking about it. But as the volume of cloud usage grows, so does the amount of sensitive data stored in the cloud, um, which you know, leads to cloud-specific cybersecurity issues such as malware injections and um, uh, APIs that are improperly secured because uh, they're a common entry point for cyber criminals. Um, and, you know, just like physical servers, accessing cloud databases requires login details, which makes usernames and passwords a valuable target. And uh, phishing emails is, still remains one of the most common methods criminals gain access to cloud login credentials. But this is where it, leads into the ethical issues and challenges for cybersecurity and tech. So because cyber is evolving and, and technology is evolving continuously and so rapidly, um, so are the threats that the organizations and, and governments face too. 
um, and it requires an equally evolving and agile workforce to evolve with it. But there's a widening gap between the demand and supply of qualified cybersecurity professionals, whether it's due to a misalignment of what companies actually need or, the, or a search for what recruiters typically look for in, in a unicorn. They want somebody you know, with 10 years experience on a platform that's only been around for two years. And you see that quite a lot. But it, it quite, quite often leads to rushed recruitment and onboarding of new cybersecurity staff and, and particularly, potentially a lack of guidance on ethical decision making and, and expectations for new cybersecurity and tech, tech recruits. And what we've seen and what I've seen from my research is when a recruit or a new starter in a cybersecurity or a technology role, they're forced to rely on their own standards of morality, which leads to differing standards of right and wrong in the workplace, which ultimately can lead to mistakes. But when an organization sets and follows ethical standards or an industry abides by regulation that enforces ethical behavior, uh, it ensures that the relevant parties are held to the same standard and everyone has a clear understanding of their ethical responsibilities. And most importantly, and Chris had touched on this, is that the C-suite and the board have to be seen by leading, have to be seen to be leading by example and engendering a culture of high standards and ethical decision making. Now, here in Australia, we've got the notifiable data breach scheme. And if you're a company worth $3 million or more and your data becomes, uh, you suffer a data breach, you legally have to inform the regulator and uh, but the the guidelines there is if it if it's possibility of causing harm to the data owner now i've heard of a lot of uh you know legal eagles and the lawyers within those companies argue black and blue over you know what constitutes serious harm um, but in my mind the answer is clear if a company's data is compromised you know it may face lawsuits and reputational damage and and questions about its ethical standards but delaying a public announcement or not being completely transparent can compound these consequences significantly. And those responsible for overseeing information security practice within the organizations, they have to ensure, like the CISO when they're supporting management, they have to ensure a fit for purpose communications policy is implemented to guide incident response procedures. And time and time again in our digital forensics and incident response team, we see it poorly handled and poorly handled communications. Uh, but there's a number of ethical considerations there. And one is the privacy of a user's data. Organizations need to consider whether they have appropriate controls and processes in place to safeguard the integrity and the privacy of their customers and their data. And a key question you need to ask yourself when determining what controls to apply is what would be the result to the data owner if this information was compromised, not just the impact to your business. And Another consideration is uh, the customer's rights to their information. Uh, this is particularly important when you're, uh, particularly in the regulated entities, when you're considering how long user data needs to be stored. Should it be deleted immediately after you've used it? Um, if it is kept, how will it be secured? Um, or a similar question is, uh, what do you do with a, a data owner's data if they died? Uh, should their family be able to gain access to it? You know, that all these ethical considerations that people don't often think about, but it happens regularly. You know, and a customer consenting to their use of their data is a critical ethical consideration. Um, it's now not enough to have those tiny little scripts at the bottom of contracts and web pages detailing users' right to their data and the company's privacy policy. Um, in, in my opinion, informed consent requires easy access easy to access and easy to read language so the user can agree to the cons and consent to the use of their data without having to go to university to study law. Now, and there's a couple of case studies that um, uh, Carissa brought up, which were great. And I'll bring up a couple of more now, which I found quite interesting. Um, you know, Yahoo was in the middle of being acquired by Verizon in 2017 when it disclosed that it had suffered three data breaches in 2013 and 2014 that had affected over 1 billion users. 
but unfortunately, because they data breaches weren't disclosed until late 2016, after the original acquisition deal had been agreed to, but it hadn't been paid for yet, much to the uh, disappointment of uh, Yahoo, I'm sure. Uh, the original deal between Verizon and Yahoo was worth $4.8 billion USD. But after the data breaches were disclosed, Yahoo's market value or their market capitalization was slashed by uh, $352 million. So quite a significant chunk of change for not being transparent about their data breaches. Additionally, the Security and Exchange Commission or the SEC in the US, they investigated Yahoo uh, for waiting too long to notify victims of the data breach. Um, and they violated their legislation by not providing documents to the SEC. And Yahoo continues even today to be liable for 50% of all the debts incurred uh, from third party litigation and from regulatory fines. Uh, that lack of ethical behavior concerning the notification of victims and, and regulatory bodies is a really apt example of the damage that can occur when um, behaviors aren't governed by ethical principles. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, and this, it's a um, example I use close to home, so you probably wouldn't have heard about it, but the Australian Red Cross, they suffered a data breach of over, over half a million of blood donors details, including uh, name, address, uh, date of birth, gender, sexual history, um, diseases, medical history. And that data was inadvertently published by a third party software contractor to an online publicly facing application form. Uh, the Red Cross um, acted extremely ethically. They immediately disclosed the data breach to affected donors and to the Australian government's computer emergency response team at the time, now called the Australian Cybersecurity Centre. And not only did the Red Cross avoid any fines for their data breach, but they all also received a extraordinary commendation. And I believe this is the only time this has happened, an extraordinary commendation for their response efforts by the commissioner of the Australian Information Commission. Uh, his name is Timothy Pilgrim. Now, the assurance that the Red Cross provided donors uh, served to increase their reputation for transparency and trust within the Australian community. And they actually got far more donors for that time of the year than they ever have previously because of their transparency and because of their commitment to their ethical standards. But another, another, uh, and this, this is an interesting one and quite disturbing. Um, you may have heard of Compass. Uh, if you haven't, it's called the Correctional Offender Management uh, Profiling for Alternative Sanctions. Now that's a fancy way of saying that they used AI in jails or correctional facilities in the US to determine the likelihood of recidivism. Now, recidivism is a prisoner's likelihood of reoffending or likelihood of committing another crime. And it was used to determine the outcome of bail or release hearings in America. And what they found was the um, algorithm was built and it contained biased data and it was less likely to look favorably upon African-Americans or people from low socioeconomic neighborhoods. And if you, you look at on the screen, the risk scores um, between the black defendants and white defendants, you can see the disparity there uh, between the risk scores, um, which is quite concerning. And uh, this platform is still in use even today. Now, wrapping it up so you've got uh, some time for questions, but to reiterate my point is there needs to be in organizations a decision-making framework that aligns with the values and the purpose of the company. Uh, the framework should achieve that balance that I spoke about earlier between organizational risk and best practice for, for cybersecurity in a well-defined and a replicable manner which meets the needs of the business along with obviously their regulatory and their legislative obligations. And it needs to ensure that leaders have access to accurate information that is as appropriate to make ethical decisions and, and to inform their ethical decision-making processes. But ethics and cybersecurity go hand in hand. Um, organizations have to establish their purpose and their values and continuously monitor the behavior of the staff in relation to these values. And customers and the public more and more expect honesty and transparency. And as, it, as I detailed earlier, 
the results can be devastating when ethical behaviour in relation to cybersecurity is ignored. And the protection of data and the prevention of harm should be the primary focus in all ethical and cybersecurity decision making. Now, uh, a couple of points of, as a minimum standard, organisations should be doing um, as a basic first step is considering the data and the assets that they own, identify what's critical to their business, do a criticality assessment and crit critical not only to the business, but critical to their consumers and customers. Um, and because it's impossible to protect everything at all times, and there's a limit, a limit to the capital available for cybersecurity budgets and IT budgets, um, the, the criticality assessment will inform where your crown jewels lie and it'll enable you to implement appropriate cybersecurity controls uh, where it matters most. Invest in cybersecurity awareness training, um, particularly since the majority of data breaches that we see occur due to human error, error such as clicking on phishing emails or uh, as basic as sending the wrong email to the wrong recipient and promoting a risk aware culture and ensuring that your staff have the capability of responding to cyber threats is a really cost effective way of reducing your risk. Um, also theft of credentials can compromise your entire network. MFA um, is um, should be rolled out everywhere that it can be, obviously without creating undue friction in end users workflows. Um, even if you have to use a, you know, a universal second factor security key um, and backing up your data, you would be surprised with the huge organisations that we deal with on a regular basis, how often we see that they don't back up their data, not even monthly, you know, they might back it up once a year and they lose tens of millions of dollars um, worth of data because they haven't backed up. But yeah, you know, that's that's all doom and gloom type stuff that I've spoken about. But there is a benefit to cybersecurity and ethical decision making. You know, it, it enhances the resilience of the company. It decreases the likelihood of a successful, a successful attack, and most importantly, subsequently increases the level of trust that organisations have with the public and their consumers. And here in Australia, after the um, the Hain Royal Commission into banking. Um, trust is now the hot topic here and, and globally as well. It's becoming more and more the hot topic. And research shows that 50% uh, of customers have said that they'll pay more for a company's services and products if they trust them. And essential to determining whether a consumer trusts an organisation is transparency about cybersecurity and about the use of their data. And through the timely disclosure of data breaches and the design of fit for purpose security controls and the informed consent of the user's data, the organizations can show that they are transparent and that they, and then they'll elicit a greater level of trust from their uh, consumers. And globally, companies need to make sure that cybersecurity and ethical decision making and data pri privacy are, is a top priority and demonstrate their commitment to the trust of their stakeholders um, if they ever hope to remain competitive in the digital age.